here love speaks up Everyone loves Lulu Welcome, 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 man, to the very first episode of Everyone Loves Lulu. I'm your special guest host, not your average Joe Savage. Uh, whether you're tuning in or watching for the very first time, we'd like to welcome you to our humble abode. Uh, we have a phenomenal guest for you today. It's only right to start this journey, man, with the inspiration behind the name. So hailing all the way from Pango Pango, American Samoa, let me introduce to you Miss C. Lulu Ayatonu Gray, a.k.a. Miss Lulu, if you're nasty. And I am extremely nasty, so <laughs> that's why I'm, I miss Lulu. Thank you for having me, talking to myself, I know. Everyone loves Lulu. I'm so excited for this journey, and Joseph, thanks for um, believing in me to have oh, this man, happen. Oh, man, come on uh, Should I say you're looking uh, simply ravishing today? Oh, well, thank you. And uh, <laughs> I took a shower for you today. Man, you know, it's always good to be in your presence. You know what? It's nice to be in your presence as well. Come I mean, on. especially since... It's been a minute. You know, we've been quarantined. It's, oh. This world has ended. And it's crazy. now it's the restart. I feel right? like a dinosaur. <laughs> uh, new year. So, uh, you know, uh, enough about the pleasantries, man. Let's go ahead and give the people what they want, man. Let's dive into your story and how we got here, right? So let's, Should let's I take be it back. scared? I feel like I was <laughs> You like, how what? far back do we need to go? Walk us through to, uh, the, the beginning. Okay. Um, well, I'm from Pangpango, American Samoa. I was actually born in Guam, in Tamuning, Guam. I know. Wow. Yeah, but I'm not Chamorro, although, hey, shout out to all the Chamorros out Come there. On. Thank you for having my mom um, give birth there, and that makes me an American citizen. So, yay! <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Didn't illegally enter like so many of my ancestors. Um, yeah, so I was actually born in Guam and then uh, moved to Samoa. So ethnicity-wise, I'm full Samoan. My mom and dad uh, moved back home. We were only in Guam for about two years, and I was only there for a year before I went back to Pango Pango. Nice. Yeah, and um, I grew up there, and I left later on. Okay. Um, probably, like, well, I, I left the island the first time. Um, to come to the mainland when I was, I want to say 13, 14, just to come visit my grandma in Utah, of all places. So it wasn't as exciting as I thought LDS it would be. LDS land? Yes. <laughs> uh, big ups to all the Mormons and the missionaries, actually, who come out to American Samoa because, man, definitely the fastest growing religion gotcha. back home. Um, but yeah, so my taste of the mainland, that's what we call it, right, from the rock, from Samoa, is uh, the mainland. And so Utah, it was a nice transition mainly because, or an introduction to the mainland for me, because it wasn't so extreme. Like, it still was very much family-oriented, very kind of um, chill lifestyle, just like Samoa, slow-moving, right? And then later on, when I actually moved, I moved to um, L.A. Uh, oh, wow. That was a complete culture shock for me. Um, How so? Well, things moved so much faster. Uh, it, a lot of the time when I would meet people, and I love people, that's why we're actually doing Everyone Loves Lulu, because I am obsessed with people. Uh, I'm so interested in everything they do, and I love everything about them. I mean, love, hate, you know, love as much as I can, but mainly <laughs> love. And, um, but when I moved to LA, I, I had that same kind of sentiment from Samoa where I just go up to people and say, hi, how are you? And when I actually ask, how are you? I'm literally waiting for a full answer, right? Not just the kind of rhetorical, Oh, good, you know, and move along. Gotcha. So when I moved to L.A. and I would meet people on the street, they thought I was nuts or on some drugs because I, I would just smile at everyone and say hi to everyone, and they weren't used to that. You know, a lot of the time I, I noticed in the big city, because then I saw the dynamic when I actually visited New York and how much so in New York, it's even worse to try. They look at you like you're really on medication <laughs> if you try to stop and say hi to them, you know? So, but yeah, um, 
So do you feel like you, you, you've gotten jaded over the, the years as far as like, you know, you've kind of become acclimated to living here? No, I think um, I've made sure that L.A. or anywhere that I'm at acclimates to me. <laughs> I, I've done my best to kind of hold that true to myself about loving people and letting I always want to feel like that safe place for them to be able to just chat me up and 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 just talk about anything and and there's no there's no um like pretty unfiltered right gotcha. and, and and that you're just comfortable that's that's kind of like the vibe i always want to give out is that we've been best friends forever and anything you say to me is just cool and i'm not going to judge you for it then i'm going to judge you later but <laughs> <laughs> so, just kidding so 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 being here in the u.s I mean, what was that experience like, you know, now that you, you know, you transferred uh, from uh, American Samoa into coming into Los Angeles? It was a huge culture shock, like I mentioned. It's so much bigger. Things move so much faster. I mean, just imagine coming from paradise, okay, uh, where it's palm trees and pineapples and the, this vast ocean and, okay, better yet, if you've seen the, the animated Disney movie Moana, right? Yes. That's pretty much what Samoa is. Um, Samoa is exactly like the scenes in Moana. And then picture being in a big city from an island like that. That's wow. kind of like, and then what, how you feel your transition would be is pretty much how mine was as well. And I'm a long way from home. It takes two flights to get from Pangpango to LA. Um, we have to stop in, and there's only two flights a week, right? So uh, it's just, it's crazy. There's so much, and, and it could easily be overwhelming when you come to the mainland versus being in a small island where you know everyone, and then you come here and you're like, no, your neighbor, <laughs> you don't even <laughs> say hi to your neighbor, right? It's like, that's really weird if you go knock on your neighbor's door and try to give them some cookies or something like, welcome to the complex. But so it was crazy. It was absolutely crazy moving to L.A., but I loved it. I felt like always my I was I was kind of like a big fish in a little pond back home in Samoa as far as ambition was concerned. I because I love people and I love to travel and I love to learn and read. I'm a big nerd, big bookworm. And so I wanted to experience the things that I read in books or watched on TV in the two channels that I grew up with. Not the two channels. TV. Yes. <laughs> with the rabbit ear antennas that you'd have to put foil around to try to get a signal. Yeah, that's, that's what uh, I grew up with. Let's talk, let's talk about uh, some of the, your ambitions. Um, I know that, you know, in reading some of your bio, right, uh, that you actually, you know, I don't know when that actually happened, but let, let's talk about your uh, your career in um, in martial arts. Okay. Um, yes, I did do judo for a long time. I actually started when I was 12, and it's actually pretty funny how I started. My I have um, seven brothers. Uh, who damn. are biological and also half brothers and um, step brothers. So yeah, apparently. So bad I'm, for your boyfriend. <laughs> yeah, the many that that were there, you know, they pretty much scared them away. So until I, I met my husband, who stuck around. I don't think he knew any better, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> they love him. But um, so me and my brother, one of my brothers who was right next to me, I'm the oldest, and one of my brothers who's. Uh, right next to me, we're only like 14 months apart. Like I said, there's only two channels on the TV. So uh, we would be best friends and worst enemies. And so with that, we would fight and laugh and cry together. And so when judo came to Samoa, I was 12 and he was 11. My brother went and tried it out. He comes home all excited, like hopped up on something. And he's just like, Lulu, we have to try judo. You have to come do judo with me. And I was like, why? And he said, because we can fight and not get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't have to say any more. The next day I was there and we, it just grew on us. And, and for some reason it, I was a natural um, at it. But then again, it's just a testament to Pacific Islanders in general, Samoans, Polynesians, how we're just kind of natural athletes. And um, 
in conflict. You know, <laughs> Which when it comes to others. fighting, it's like you, you start your first, uh, what's, it, what's it called, like your first fighting partners are your siblings. And I feel like we had some prior training until we got to, you know, got to judo. And then I excelled in it. So my brother actually left and came to the States um, and finished school here. But I continue with judo to the point where um, I got to travel. Judo was my way of being able to travel all over the world and actually live in different parts of the world. Wow. I've lived, yeah. I've lived in New Zealand, in Australia. I've lived in Singapore, in Germany. I've stayed in Dubai. I've. Um, you said Dubai. Dubai. Talk yes. about that. Well, Dubai, or man, this feels like forever ago because it really was. But in Dubai, you. I felt like I was in a different world altogether. Like whatever your imagination, whatever you could imagine, that's what Dubai could make happen for you. It was possible in Dubai. Like the buildings there were insane. Heard it's phenomenal. It looked crazy. Like it looked like it was literally something made up in a movie that it shouldn't be standing there. There was like, a, I, I, I distinctly remember this building that was shaped like a sailboat. You know, it was like, it was a huge boat. And you're like, that's a building. <laughs> Did you get uh, offered any money by a sheik? You know what I mean? To be like his uh, fifth wife? No, I wish. <laughs> but, you know, with our judo camp, we were very much tight knit and kind gotcha. of protected and, 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 you know, the preserved, I guess. And just pretty much away from the limelight. And we only were there for judo or for training and then we'd go back to reality. That was the only thing about being, um, I guess, you know, I, I never think of myself as a professional athlete, but at the time I was. And you don't really get to see and, and explore the places that you're training in or that you're living in at the moment because you're so consumed with your sport. Yes. Yeah, so that's why I got really excited when I was able to be a part of the Olympics in 2008. Ooh, but, talk about that. But re rewind a little bit. Um, one of the other cool places that I got to visit and actually spend some time in was Egypt. I was in Cairo. Whoa. That felt like I was transported back in time. Like, you know, when you're reading the Bible and I jump off the plane and everything is sand colored and there's pyramids and the only thing that was a little off was that there were, the guards all had machine guns, it looked like. <laughs> so I'm military, I'm like, uh. But everybody thought when I was in Egypt, the locals thought that I was... A local. Yeah, they thought that I was Egyptian. And it tripped me out, honestly, because then it, you know, we don't really know as Samoans where we originate from, like where we originally came from. I think we you, all came from Africa. Uh, I'm pretty sure. Yes. Specifically Egypt, because... <laughs> It felt like I was home, minus the sand and all the crazy desert feeling. Uh -huh. All the locals looked just like my brothers and my friends in Samoa and all of us in Samoa. So that was interesting to see. So did you get to see some of the like the pyramids and, and, and things like yes, that? Yes, I got to ride a camel. That was a trip. <laughs> um, so I don't know what you picture. For me, when I pictured riding a camel, it was like very romantic and kind of... Uh, you know, fantastic, right? It's really dirty okay. <laughs> riding a camel. First of all, it's a desert, so there's sand everywhere. You can't help but just have dirt everywhere, right? But then on top of it, these are large animals. It's kind of scary. They're really big, and they spit kind of like a llama, you know, and so they're, <laughs> they, they um, just did not smell good gotcha. either. You know, so that was What do they fun. smell like? Um... They smelled like a wet rug. Oh, like, that a, like, like, like a belly button. Yeah. <laughs> or, or the back of your, your ears. Yeah. Oh, my. Like really? an earbag. My mommy's gotcha. Gosh, gotcha. 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 <laughs> No, no, I got them. I got them. So that's good. <laughs> but yeah, it's like a, like a wet rug because they still have kind of fur and they're coarse. And then they're just out in the heat all the time. But yeah. So you mentioned the Olympics. I did. That uh, was insane. Mind-blowing. That is crazy. 
once in a lifetime opportunity for some people who have been to multiple um, Olympics. Well, that's more than once for them. But for me, it was definitely a once in a lifetime opportunity. And it was my, it's everything and more. Which, and which Olympics? I went to the 2008 Beijing Olympics in China. And what was cool about that is that I actually got to go there a month before um, the Olympics actually started so that we could get acclimated to the climate and do training there for our event. Um, and oh my gosh, we were in the Olympic Village, so we had our own little like building. I heard about the Olympic Village. What'd you hear? And uh, I mean, and this was uh, something- I'll play the fifth. TMZ, Ronda Rousey, when, when she nothing. was on there, she said that the, the Olympic Village or the wherever all the athletes stay mm -hmm. is like a full on like- It's, it's an orgy. Yes. It's think about the best shape of your life and just all these athletes, right? They're all in the prime. best shape of they're in the prime. They're they're just at prime the peak, pumped. right? For and then of course, hormones are flying everywhere because you've been training so hard and now you get to kind of let loose after your event, you know, and and just all these beautiful people. Wow. Uh in one place. Uh, can you name some of the beautiful people that no, were there? No, absolutely not. That were there at the Olympics. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you know, I actually was at the same seen. Olympics as Ronda Rousey, so that was okay. really cool. Um, we, she's she was a judo fighter. She's actually a weight class. Um, I was just gonna me. say, did you fight her? No, but we got to train actually. Okay. Um, she probably won't even remember me, but we we is did she some the training real deal? camps. She's the real deal. She is. She is a force to be reckoned with, especially in the judo community. Everybody pretty much was scared of her, especially, well, so I was in 63 kilos, you know, that was my weight category. Mm. And then she was in the 70 kilos, which is the one, um, just one higher than mine. But she used to be in the 63 kilos, but man, she's just, she's cr crazy fit and, and just a lot of the guy in her training camps from what I remember, she usually trained with men. Like, she trained with men. Mm. I mean, a lot of us did cross-train like that, but, I mean, she actually held her own against the guys. Oh, she, she guys. was beating up the men. <laughs> yes. Gotcha. Pretty much. <laughs> okay, let, let, you know what? We don't want to glaze over the other people that you've seen. So you've seen Ronda Rousey, who everybody knows. Yep, and uh, I got to actually see, um, I'm sorry, I'm excited to talk about this, the whole U.S. team. So I had the honor of being the flag bearer. Okay. For um, American Samoa, Ooh. and we were right behind the U.S. team. Talk about when it. we were doing, you know, the the flag uh, presentation, and all of the U.S. athletes. I mean, that's when the dream team, right, with uh, um, for basketball. So, oh, rest in love, Kobe Bryant. I got to meet wow. him. I got to meet his dad. Oh my gosh, they were. He was such a babe <laughs> he really was Kobe being I'm Brian like, I'm gonna have to edit this out because I feel like I'm blushing no no. <laughs> no he he was okay and then LeBron James you know got to meet LeBron James as well there we go um and I'm not gonna lie he was I I was excited to see all these athletes and and because you know back home we they're like untouchable. You never get to meet these people in real yeah. life. And then you get to be in the same kind of class as them, right? But we're all the same, like we're all athletes. And so we all sit in the same area at the Olympics. And that was a trip because they weren't any better than me or I wasn't any better than them. It was like a colleague. Know, like, yeah, we're all just chilling. Teammate. And so, and that was another really cool thing about the Olympics was that all the athletes had a free pass to watch any sport. I mean, I got to meet Michael Phelps. Um, oh, wow. who's, um, Usain Bolt. Like that was, that, that Olympics was insane because all the greats of the greats and all these records were being shattered all over the place. And then even the prior Olympians were talking about how Beijing was the best um, Olympics that they had ever attended. Like China went completely um they they went above and beyond to make sure that they were going to be remembered uh, as like the best host country gotcha. 
and uh, they let, did. They let's were. talk about the most important thing out there. Like, how was the food? <laughs> okay. In the Olympic Village, this was what was nuts about it. They made sure that there was food from every single um, attending country. That don't make no bit of sense. Is that nuts? Like... So they had every, I don't know how they did it, but they did it. Um, and then we had our very own McDonald's in, like, all of this is free. I don't think you can understand what I'm talking about. It was completely free. They just had the, a McDonald's in the Olympic Village. just, And you could just go up and order as much or as little as you want That's for capitalism. no cost. That's capitalism at its best right there. I was I mean, uh, how are you going to serve McDonald's to some of the, you know, <laughs> the best athletes in the world? How about it was there was always a line, though. <laughs> 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 and I really think it's because you're so strict, right, um, with your training for four years straight. And then this is your time to actually celebrate and let loose and and have your cheat month, you know, <laughs> until you have to go back to to training again. Okay, so let's dive into the the debauchery that that happened, you know, uh, you know after you know, like you said, everybody let loose. So you know, I'm pretty sure you've seen, you know, you probably seen. I'm not saying. Yeah, that I you, was more of a voyeur. Yeah, I didn't yeah, yeah. really participate because uh, I was pretty did. lame because I had um, I was in a relationship and oh. I was like, I'm an idiot. No, I'm wow. just kidding. <laughs> Sorry, you um, had that problem. <laughs> So I got to watch a lot okay. of things and see a lot gotcha. of things. Gotcha. Um, uh, yeah. That, okay. This is what was funny Please. is that a lot of people, you, you don't speak the same language, you know? Okay. Um, so when you're meeting somebody that you find attractive, you can't understand what the fuck they're saying. Like, you're yeah. literally going, much. Um, hi. You're like using hand gestures. You're trying to freaking uh mime something out you know like you me uh, you know like, uh, it's like it was all crazy but it worked out they didn't know? speak they didn't speak the same language but their body spoke the same language absolutely body oh, language man. was a hundred percent uh coherent you yeah. could understand it perfectly wow <laughs> you know to okay. looking across the freaking uh, when you're training stretching stretching was a whole nother mm, there's a lot of stretching going <laughs> I mean, on i was there. like man they're stretching a little too long <laughs> post and pre Ooh, right whoa. now <laughs> <laughs> okay the nightlife in um in china was pretty cool gotcha to uh, okay sorry there's so much about the olympics that are just coming back to me now but when we arrived this is when you think that there's so many people and population wise in america it's nothing compared to when you visit China because the amount of people in that place is mind-blowing. So much so that there's thousands of athletes that come to this, right? Okay. Each athlete had on the minimum three assistants, three Chinese assistants. Why would you need three Chinese assistants? Because they were all volunteers. They just wanted to be a part of this historic event, right? And we just had assistants. Like, I walked, I was like, okay, okay, this is your Chinese assistants. Assistants, like three of them. And they would just be there until you excuse them to go home. Okay, let's paint this picture. Was it sort of like... Uh like coming to America, where you actually they bathe you, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> I'm sure if I asked them to, they would have. But the funny thing was, is when I met the assistants, they had to, I guess, assimilate or make it easier for everybody. And so when we asked them what their name was, right, or when they would introduce themselves, they had an English name. They had an American, <laughs> you know, just a like, oh, I can barely understand what this person is saying. Their English is, you know pretty choppy but then their name is like tom my, yeah my gotcha. name is tom uh gotcha. jenny like becky like what the and then i would start laughing i was like i'm so sorry i don't mean to be disrespectful but what is your real name like what is your chinese if you have to learn my name see lulu right it's not yeah. a regular english name what is your name and then they would you know say whatever their name was i'm like becky it is <laughs> 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 okay, three, yeah, three assistants. I um, did. Gotcha. Every, everybody did. Gotcha. Oh, it's crazy. 
uh, ate some of the best cuisines in the world. In the world. Got to see some of the the, the top athletes in the world. Mm -hmm. And watch them perform, like actually perform. see their event. So that was pretty cool. Anything else uh, that, that you remember from that experience being in there? Um, gosh, that's that pretty much covers it. Uh, I think the best part was being able to represent my country and 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 bear the flag yeah you know that was that was really cool were you automatically like a, a local celebrity when you went back home yes yes i was, <laughs> I was. what does that come with i mean do you have your, you know do they, do they just name? more fala vilave you oh, know like okay. i was gonna say <laughs> which in our culture day? means in our language it just means like you pretty much pay more like you pay more to the rest gotcha. of the community rather than you getting any perks per se <laughs> although i did get a billboard um in in samoa across from the college of me drinking a coca-cola that's big that was pretty big that's and then also i was the pamphlet for the massage um spa for the spa for the oh. the, the main hotel in american Is that samoa Korean style? The what? <laughs> no. <laughs> Never mind. Like, maybe. <laughs> I'm, okay. Yeah, I'm just putting that out there. I mean, so, 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 you know, experiencing that, you know, being at the Olympics, I mean, that's just a, one of the highlights of anybody's life, right? I forget that I even did it because it was so long ago. Um, and when I get down on myself, probably, you know, I get, I'm like, oh, what have I done with my life? Where am I now? And I'm like, Oh wait, I did the Olympics. Yeah, doing pretty good. Exactly. <laughs> so, so like you know, what was what was the transition from, you know, uh, um, you know, uh, I guess training and being at the Olympics into that next phase in your life? Okay, so ever since I was young, I loved movies. I loved kind of um, mimicking. I, I guess you would say I would I would say all the lines in the shows. I would, uh, and I also um, sang as well, so music is a big part of my life. Uh, but, but I feel like all Polynesians, that's kind of where we start, how we tell our stories, right, in song. And um, so I was fascinated. I was fascinated with acting and theater. And we didn't have those opportunities in Samoa. So when I was doing, when I was doing judo, uh, music was still a part of my life and we didn't have any performing arts things in school. So when I moved to the States, I got introduced to the performing arts. And as I was still doing judo, I found that um, I really absolutely loved uh, the performing arts, acting uh, specifically. So. What was it about uh, acting that, that really kind of drew you to it? For me, for me, acting, I had to look at it from what I experience when I'm watching a movie. And it's an escape for me. So I wanted to be that escape for other people, you know, like to whatever, whether it's a sitcom for 30 minutes or it's a whole movie for an hour and a half to two hours. I got to be that escape. And that also ties in with just my love of people. And I wanted to be that, you know. So, like transitioning from your love of acting and uh, song and dance into uh, what you're currently doing right now, as far as radio, uh, yeah. What was that process like? Well, in entertainment, I feel like everything is tied in to each other. So, I was actually in a singing competition for Pacific Islanders. Uh, shout out to Uncle Tui, Le Tui, and. Um, I came across, I was being interviewed, I was one of the contestants for the singing competition, and I was asked to be interviewed by the barbecue show. Oh, the phenomenal, world, <laughs> world famous. The world famous, <laughs> self-proclaimed barbecue show. And it was actually out of the, um, the, the museum, right, in Long Beach. And I lived in Long Beach, and so it just felt like home. And I walked in and I met these bigger than life people like the personalities were just through the roof just <laughs> phenomenal <laughs> phenomenal individuals yeah but i was in the singing singing competition with my brother as well and it was the year that there would be a female and a male winner and we were interviewed by none other than the not so average joe, joe savage, savage. <laughs> <Stop playing. laughs> 
and Q Boo, right? Q. On air with Q. Um, I'm trying to. I think it was just the two of you. Oh, we can't forget. Uh, you was know, he the, the MC? The one legged Casanova. Yeah, I was. I was like. God, he was so forgettable. I didn't. I wasn't sure if he was there. <laughs> I love you, E. No, yeah, and E the MC. So we got to, we got to um, interview, and and I, I don't, I never even thought about radio or or that side of entertainment until I I met the barbecue show. I fell in love, and then they offered me an opportunity. I guess you offered me an opportunity to kind of try out my chops as a personality. As a barbecuity, yes. <laughs> when we were barbecuties. What was that like, being a barbecuity? <laughs> There's no other experience like it in life. I mean, if you ever get the opportunity to be a barbecuity, run. No, I'm just kidding. Um, like, you think the Olympics is a big deal? Frick, like, barbecuities. Doesn't get bigger down. than that. Doesn't <laughs> get bigger than that. Uh, you, you eventually, you know, uh, you know, found your voice. Mm. And you transitioned into your own situation. Um, and let's talk about that, your own show. I was the situation. I'm not going to lie. No, uh, Barbecue Show gave me the opportunity to have my own show, which, uh, rest in love to lip service. <laughs> so sad to see you go. I know, but that was a big foundation um, for, for who I am today. So lip service... I got to actually start that show from the ground up and worked closely with you, um, Joe Sav, and also with Q, and it was a no-holds-bar. It was like that, that marriage of having that safe haven for the people that I love so much, and I, when I say people, I just mean the human condition, right? And, um, and I, it was a, a no-holds-bar, it was an adult show, in the sense of we could say pretty much whatever we wanted to say. There was no subject that was um, that was untouchable. For instance? For instance, we talked about sex. We talked about mm. um, the most taboo subjects uh, because as a Pacific Islander and as a Samoan, we didn't get to talk about that. We never get to talk about that. Like when I had my, my menstrual cycle for the first time, I thought I was wow. literally dying and I was bleeding out from the vagina. You know, it's like, what the fuck is going on? Nobody tells you anything. And I just had a mental picture of, <laughs> of my vagina or the blood. Yeah. <laughs> Both at the same wow, time. Wow, just, that just, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, imagine a freaking 13, almost 14-year-old girl going through it, never even heard of it. You know, lucky I had older cousins, but they still don't talk about it. So then I go and I talk to my mom, right? And I'm like, Mom, I took a shower, and I'm getting ready for school, and I'm like, Mom, I'm dying. I, I love you so much. I'm literally dying. And she's looking at me half asleep going, what do you mean you're dying? I was like, I'm bleeding from the... I'm, bleeding like i couldn't even say right because we don't really we don't talk we don't talk about those areas yes. we uh um, yeah very taboo there's no dating there's no all of a sudden people get married you're like how what but you're <laughs> not even not allowed pregnant. to date anybody yeah like you're pregnant I'm like what how did you even know how to do that so my mom just starts laughing and i'm devastated going like you're laughing that i'm dying she's like no you're a woman now still wouldn't explain shit to me i was like Okay, I'm a woman. What does that mean? What does that mean? I'm a woman now. I don't get it. Um, so then my dad comes home. My dad comes home, and I'm embarrassed. Like, first of all, I go to school, and and I'm like... With the blood on, on you? Or? Well, yeah. Now, I mean, my mom took me and got pads. It's like a, always with the wings. So she goes, you're very go. lucky because we used to use, you know, fabric and just roll that up or whatever we could do to kind of plug it up there. So... Very old school. I know. So I was like, oh, I must feel so lucky, you know? <laughs> and so after school, and I'm just paranoid, and my dad comes home, and then he just hugs me. Okay, and my dad is not a very um, affectionate man, you know? He's, I, I want to say in the sense he's kind of a typical Psalm once where Many. parents yes. just don't say I love you. They don't really compliment you for shit, you know? They pretty much tell you what you're doing wrong, mostly. But he hugged me, and so that was already taking me aback. And he hugged me, and he held me really tight and long. And I'm like, okay, what's going on? Very he forward. goes, yeah, and he said, he's like, he's like, you're a woman now. I'm so proud of you. And I'm like, just, I, 
think the blood <laughs> all went out of my vagina at that point. It's like, I'm completely white. I look like a ghost. I'm so embarrassed. I couldn't believe I'm looking at my mom with distrust. I'm like, I can't believe you broke our code. Why did you tell dad? I'm like, what the hell? So, and I mean, that was kind of my welcoming into womanhood. But wow. anyway, that was a big segue into lip service. I wanted there to be a place where girls like me and anybody from the island who didn't get to ask those questions, right? That they could ask those questions and, and find out whatever information they could in, in kind of like in the safety of their own home, um, anonymously. Um, it's like so a that, trust tree. Yes, exactly. That trust circle, you know, where it's just like, hey, it's okay you're not weird or you're not crazy for wanting to or for having these questions or for having these feelings or these urges and and there's a place that you can come and 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 ask all of them and and not be judged for it i mean what was some of the response from a lot of your listeners i think initially the older generation especially my family members i mean even though they know me oh, and how oh, outspoken yeah. i am a lot of the time how was that conversation yeah, they, th I'm not going to lie, they were a bit disappointed, right? They were disgusted, probably, because uh, I think one of my first shows kind of set the tone and we just put it all out there, you know, talking about sex, talking about penises, vaginas, and like, mm. just, it, it was, I mean, cussing up a storm. It, yeah. it was all crazy. We were trying to find and, and kind of like, like our middle ground. kind of gathering around the, you know, the, the dinner table listening to it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a lot of my cousins who are my age and my generation, they would be listening to me because um, it was every Wednesday in the evening, right? Kind of late at night. And they would still be at work. And so they would try to have um, the radio on uh, while they're working, but then quickly realize that they had to turn it down <laughs> or have their <laughs> headphones on. Because there was definitely some debauchery that was coming through the airways, for sure, with lip service. But, I mean, just some of the guests that I was able Talk about to, to interview was uh, one of the, I mean, one of the best and, and actually one of the biggest stars in their own right is Troy Polamalu. I was Legend. Able, I was able to... Hall of Famer. Yes, Hall of Famer. And now just like, he's a Hall of Fame as a person in life. Um, just recently, I've, I've found out that he's taken um, Manti Teo, who was also on lip service. Come on. Very, very proud of that as well um, during the height of his career, but took him under his wing, and now he's, he's still playing, you know, and, and that's really great. Um, gosh, it feels like so long ago, but I, I actually had some pretty cool guests come through. Um, Mike Upati, she was one of my guests. Uh, Jesse Sapolu. Legend. Yeah. 49ers. Yep. Uh, yes. And anybody that knows me knows that I am a hardcore 49er fan. So much so. Oh, wow. Another segue here that I got married in crimson and gold. That was my red wedding dress was red and gold. <laughs> that is so sad. <laughs> Almost uh, lost my husband, that but so I, I kind of <laughs> reeled it back in. In the Catholic Church, no less. Oh, wow. We, I had permission. Blasphemy. I made sure to get permission, you know, so. <laughs> you, know, you know, during that time uh, with lip service, you know, you were actually able to take part in a, you know, I think it was such a monumental event. Um, one of the movies that Disney put out uh, that really kind of represented, you actually mentioned it before. Yes. Uh, Moana. You yes. actually uh, was able to, to work the blue carpet. The blue carpet. I mean, we were so dope that they had to change the carpet color for all of us PIs, you yeah. know. There was no more red carpet, it was blue carpet. But no, yeah, I got to work the red carpet. It was actually one of our first major events. Um, you know, you were there, Joe Sav, and I had just given birth, mind you. You don't say. <laughs> I had just given birth. A uh, shout out to Lyft uh, Fashions, right? My girl Nancy, who designed my dress um, that definitely accentuated the the source of baby food, <laughs> which oh tits. yeah, the the memories are out. <laughs> the memories. Yeah. Oh yeah, there was a lot of memories for, from the memories for sure. But uh, that was a cool experience to be kind of 
it also gave me kind of a perspective of what the media is is treated like, right? Like we're all sequestered off, roped off in this little we're like a meat market of <laughs> give you like a packed in inches. like sardines. <laughs> yeah, and we were just there on the side, like looking like beggars, pretty much begging whoever to come and interview like to interview with us, right? So who did you get to interview? I got to interview well everybody from um from the from the Moana cast, but Definitely the most memorable would be Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Wow. Yes. The man. The man, the myth, the living legend himself. He smelled really that? good. Okay. That's the first thing that comes to mind. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he, he, wow, what a presence to be in. And I completely get it. I get why he is the superstar he is because he is just so eloquent. He um, does so much for our people. Um, and then also for just paving or opening that door for all of us Pacific Islanders to be um, the number one actor or whatever in entertainment. It's like, so cool. Were you nervous? Um, I think at that point, because we had been standing there so long, and I was so engorged. Uh, when I when I mean by that, for those of you who don't know, when I breastfed both my babies, and I I, I was oh, in the height just, of it. You were full of milk, dude. So my dress already was very re revealing in the chest area. Gotcha. But as the day went on, I don't know if you remember, Joe. But it just got like even more and more revealing. It's like it looked like I was holding. That I was holding like a pump or something, and I just kept pushing the air because my boobs just got bigger and bigger and Man. bigger. It was like. Looked like aisle nine in the produce <laughs> section, huh? So, my God. I could have probably. Um, uh, was, was it? I, I could have solved starvation. I could have fed every Man. baby that ever starved. I was like so engorged. I had milk for days and I couldn't go anywhere. So my baby was actually in the green room per se, right? Um, because Nonocino was there and I'm just so grateful that they had a room to where we could actually, I could have my baby uh, just go. chilling because my husband also was on the blue carpet with my brother-in-law. They were, they actually led out um, uh, the rock uh, oh, wow. on the blue carpet with song. So shout out to my husband. I don't think I've mentioned him yet, but my husband is Tomata Gray, and he's part of the Common Kings. But we were both there. Only he was moving freely on the blue carpet while we were kind of quarantined, right? Like we were locked <laughs> up on the side. <laughs> the media, it's like, man, those dirty people over there. <laughs> give them, give them a bone every now and then. I mean, being that you know, it was such a. Uh a crazy, hectic night, right? I mean, and, and again, like you said... It was, what, like 10 hours we yeah. were we were there. And so imagine being engorged, okay? Because okay? I know you think about this all the time, Joe. All the time. Um, being engorged and, I, okay, as, as as a new mom as well. So you have to pump and release or it, it physically hurts. Mm. I am in pain while trying to put a smile on while this thing is being filmed. And then I'm meeting The Rock. Then he comes in for a hug. You know, remember the times when we could actually hug people and it yes. was okay without a mask? Um, he hugs me and I'm pretty sure I squirted him somehow. Wow. Like with, Squirting. With my memories. Right. Wow. <laughs> Probably would have poked his eye out without... Not too many women know how to squirt. I mean, so <laughs> that is definitely... Especially from the tits, okay? So... Wow. That's, I was pretty talented back then. <laughs> you have you are a woman of many talents. <laughs> yeah, I uh, yeah, it was it was something. Uh, else. Could you recall? Or were there any? Uh, was there a, a moment of that night that that uh, any of the people that you were trying to interview probably like just you know didn't want to interview with you and just kind of snubbed you? And you know, kept, there was one it. that I was actually a really big fan of. Okay, and that made me because I'm a huge fan of Pussycat Dolls. Right, and uh, oh. so, hey, shout Which out one? to Which Nicole one? Scherzinger, Sch Scherzinger, Schwerzinger. Okay. Yeah, Nicole, right? Um, 
she actually, I don't know if she wanted to or didn't want to interview with me or if it was just like too much of a crowd around. I'm not quite sure, but I was very sad that I didn't get to interview her. I think I think it was one of those things where it was like, you know, she's seen another hen in the hen house. Really? Yeah. And, you know, she's seen the engorgement. Right? Yeah, she probably was like, she mm, felt, mm, that boob job is looking real wrecked. No. <laughs> Maybe she was smelling the mammaries. You know, she was like... Oh, she's actually lactating. Gotcha. I don't have that, and she does. Very interesting. <laughs> oh, my Very gosh. Interesting. I can't believe how much time we're spending on how, <laughs> how I was lactating and, and, you know, squirting people with my breast milk. No, this is very Although, interesting. Although, it's liquid gold, people, okay? Breast milk is... Not everybody can do it, so I was very fortunate to be able to. You know, you mentioned, you know, fast forward out of this. Let me go ahead and, and, and uh, <laughs> get pivot. out of the get out of the milk breast breast let's, milk. Let's go ahead and pivot out of that. <laughs> uh, let, let's talk about um, you mentioned your husband. Yes. Uh, Tom I have Monta one Gray. of those. Tom Monta Gray. <laughs> yes. Superstar, rock star, uh, both on and off stage. Yeah. When 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 and how did that happen? Um, okay, so we got together, oh my gosh, 2000, it's 2021 now, we're 10 years together and about to be 8 years married. Um, so do the math, what was that, like 2012, 11? Yeah, 2011 is when we, we actually started dating, but we had known each other probably in 2006, we started as friends. Um... And then 2011, we were both single, and we decided, apparently he always had a crush on me. I didn't know. Um, I put him in the bro zone pretty hard. Oh, wow. <laughs> because I had just come out of a relationship for four years, and I wasn't, I, I, I was happy to be single and not ready to mingle whatsoever. Gotcha. I actually gave myself a whole year. I said I wasn't gonna date anyone and just date myself, you know, for a whole year before I even considered um, a relationship. So you put him in the friend zone. Yeah, not knowingly, not knowing that he was interested in me. Um, and then come to find out he was, and I had just, I was freshly single. So I had talked to him and he was gracious enough to wait for me for a whole year. Oh, wow. Yeah, I said like, I need a whole year. To not date, and I need a whole year to be single before I can. Who the hell does that these days? <laughs> I know. I, I mean, I knew he was the one when, after a year, um, he was still around. You know, and that's when. So he was with Not Too Soul, right? They were Not Too Soul before they were Common Kings, and then when we became official, uh, when we were officially dating, like with the titles and everything. A few months afterwards, Common Kings was born. Beautiful. And their journey started. Yeah. Beautiful. And and here you guys are to this day. And here we are, two babies later. Um, our my oldest Soli, who just turned four last September, and then Leolo Fitzaute, um, who we call Gigi, our girl. Um, she turns three in March. Wow. I know they're only a year and a half apart. I don't know what I was thinking. I was insane. Lost my mind temporarily. You, <laughs> you know what? Um, kind of, you know, fast forward, you know what I mean, to pretty much last year and this year, right? Um, you know, the world underwent something that we've never experienced before in our lives, right? Yes. Uh, COVID-19, right? Whew. And um, Like, we don't talk about that. The pandemic. We don't see it. Uh, there's, there was so, much, so many different layers of 2020 that people want to, uh, you know, just, just really kind of forget. But uh, you actually experienced COVID-19. Yes. Um, I got it. Yeah. I caught it. I mean, I had it, right? <laughs> I should be more clear. I don't have it right now. I have the antibody still, so that's really great. But, yes, on July 11th, I'll never forget. It was a Saturday. And um, it still was pretty novel, right? I mean, at the time, I didn't know anybody personally that that had it um so to actually have it like it was scary it was absolutely scary it was one of probably the scariest things i've ever experienced mainly because it was still so new 
I don't know, nobody really knew. There was new information happening literally like second by second. And all you know about COVID at the time was that it's kind of like a death sentence, right? You don't know how you're going to react to it and whether or not you're going to survive it. So um, I, was, I was actually quite surprised because Rewind, when the shutdown happened, I had a quarantine birthday. Okay. Fucking pissed in 2020. And then I swear the New Year's resolution for 2020 was that, you know, this is my year, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, everything great's going to happen in 2020. And then God said, no, ta, laughed at us and said, no, this is when the world ends. So then March comes around and it was right at St. Patty's Day. So it was like March 14th, right, was when the actual official shutdown happened. And then people still thought it was fake news and still trying to go for, for St. Patty's Day. And my birthday is March 19th. And my birthday is a huge deal for me. I always celebrate my birthday. And I couldn't. I had to. It was the first time that, you know, we had to do it quarantined. And it was right in the beginning of it. So we didn't even know how how to actually go about it. So it was just me and Tito's, the vodka, and <laughs> I just kind of sang happy birthday to myself and <laughs> went through that. But that kind of spelled the year. Yeah, that, that really did kind of, that kind of summed it up for me. I was like, well, there goes 2020. But then even then you're like, oh, we're, this is America, bitch. Like, not going to shut down that long. And then fast forward to July 11th when I got COVID. Okay, so I took it really seriously. When the shutdown happened, I am a law-abiding citizen. Okay. And I quarantined. I didn't go anywhere. I was that psycho that would um, Clorox wipe, if you could find a Clorox wipe, right? Um, uh, disinfectant wipes. Yeah, I was would a shortage, dis- right? Yes, I would disinfect everything. Like when the groceries would get sent, I would let it sit out there in the sun because, you know, at the time, the, some of the information was saying like, oh, exposure to natural sunlight can kill the virus. So I was like letting stuff sit out there a little longer than they probably should have. And then when I would bring it into the house, I would wipe everything down and then I would shower myself. I was like, I probably took like 12 showers a day and can't even count how many times I washed my hands and how many times I sang um, happy birthday, you know, like to make sure that I was getting the 20 seconds in, getting creative with the kids, washing their hands. And um, so it really surprised me when I got COVID. But then my husband um, was still at work. So he still had to go to work. And even though he said he was practicing social distancing really well, but you know, We'll never know. Uh, he actually had the symptoms first. And for oh, him... Oh, so he was the spreader. Yeah, super spreader gotcha. right there. Yeah, I said it right here. You're the super spreader, honey, but that's okay. I still love you, obviously. Um, his reaction was way different. So he got hit with the symptoms hardcore for three days. Um, like, he showed symptoms the, that afternoon and then by the nighttime he was like at 104 fever couldn't move and as long as i've known and i've been with with mata he's never been sick he's never been sick i one time he was sick for half a day that's it so to see him actually down for the count i was really nervous i was like oh my gosh i think you have covid and he's like no he and he didn't have the loss of smell or loss of taste he actually had um he had the conjunctivitis which is pink eye Right, oh, which wow. is like a rare symptom for it, but the fatigue was there. Didn't have any um, respiratory issues whatsoever, but just the fever. Um, so it was just fever, fatigue, and then the pink eye. And he only had it for three days. He didn't even have a cough or nothing. But he said he had, oh maybe a headache. So for me, he showed symptoms that Friday. I started showing symptoms that Saturday, July 11th. But mine were very mild. Mine were very mild and they were gradual. So then I thought, oh, okay, cool. I'm probably going to be more asymptomatic or uh, very mild symptoms. Because prior to this, I had had my blood work done before the shutdown. And my doctor had told me that I was the picture of health. You know, So in my head already, I'm like, if I get COVID, when I get COVID, because I knew it was only a matter of time with how they were saying that it's so contagious, right? So I'm like, we're all going to get it one time or another, unless you're an exception, of course. But 
Um, so when I thought that I was going to get it, I thought, okay, I got this. This is, I'm probably going to be one of the lucky ones where I'm not even going to feel it happen. But then every single day I added a new symptom. I literally had every single symptom um, that was out at the time, oh, wow. except for vomiting, blood, and um, what was the other? Oh, I mean, vomiting and coughing blood. Those were the only two I didn't have. Everything else I had. The breathing issues were really crazy for me because I had never experienced respiratory issues ever. And I have a newfound respect for people that have respiratory issues like asthma. Because, I mean, I'm not going to lie, growing up in Samoa, any sign of weakness, which is like if you have asthma, we just make fun of you the whole time. We're like, whatever. Like, this is a choice. You know, you can breathe. Just go ahead and breathe. But after experiencing COVID, that shit kicked my ass. I was down for two months. Wow. Two months. So the brunt of it was in 16 days. Um, and the recovery period, the aftermath of COVID still took about a month and a half for me to feel 100%. You actually uh, sort of took some some notes on this, right? I did. I did. You recorded so, it, right? Um, yeah, I journaled. Um my experience because there was a certain regimen of supplements that I was taking Okay. Uh, that I definitely, I, I don't want to go too into it, but I mean, there was like certain doses of, of vitamin C and um, vitamin D and uh, like I actually was fortunate enough to get a medication that was similar to hydrochloroquine. So I know that there was a lot of kind of conspiracy around hydrochloroquine, whether it worked or whether it didn't. But I was like, at that point, I, I, needed, to, I needed to actually take something okay. that I felt like was going to work. Gotcha. Yeah. So it was called glutathione um, was what I was exposed to or, or what I was able to take that was similar. It's like the safer version of a hydrochloroquine from what they were telling me. Um, but big shout out to Metagenics, which is my sister-in-law's a company and they're a high-end like supplement company and so they have their doctors on hand that do all this sort of extensive research um and, and it's and it's uh, and it's literally like second by second you know so they come up they have they have the ins and outs of what's what's new and what's helping and what and what to do so they broke it down into three stages where there was the preventative and there was like the mild symptoms and then the extreme symptoms um, but yeah, I, I kind of want to read uh, an excerpt from my journal so that it could get an idea of, of what I kind of went through. So it all started Saturday, July 11th. I woke up feeling um, a little more sluggish than usual, my sinus pressure and a major headache, which the headache was really crazy because it felt like brain freeze. Um, and I didn't think much of it, and I soldiered through my day because, you know, as like a mom, uh, which is full time, you feel like I can sweat it out. This is nothing, you know. I gave birth unmedicated, all natural. So I'm like, oh, whoa. I got this shit. <laughs> but then the next morning, which was Sunday, my whole body ached, and I thought to myself, crap, this feels like I caught a cold or maybe the flu, or at least I was hoping, although I was already witnessing what my husband was going through, right? And then on Monday, which was also my wedding anniversary, so all this shit is happening during this time, right? Uh, Fourth of July just happened, then I have my wedding anniversary. Um, and then I felt like an unfamiliar slight pressure in my chest added to all the other ailments. And then Tuesday, while walking up the short flight of stairs to my place, I felt like I had the wind knocked out of me. I was really out of breath, which I had never experienced before in my life. Wednesday, July 15th in the afternoon, while changing my two-year-old's massive poop diaper, I realized I couldn't smell it. I couldn't smell it at all, but I had no nasal congestion, which made it even more weird. And being a mom, my senses are heightened, um, especially my sense of smell. And my daughter being two years old, well, you can only imagine what kind of <laughs> poops this little girl was dishing out. You know, like some grown people poops at that time. So I literally had the shit like to my nose, right? Because I couldn't believe it. It was the most oddest sensation about the virus. I, I could smell during 
in the morning and the early afternoon and then late afternoon, it was just gone. Like Done. You should just couldn't smell anything. So then I immediately run to try and taste something. And sure enough, that was gone as well. I could only taste hints of whether something was really sweet or whether something was really salty. And I don't do spicy food. And I found the spiciest thing I could find because my husband likes spicy food. And I couldn't taste it. I could only taste hints of salt. That blew my mind. Um, so then I was convinced. Whatever doubts I might have had in my mind about uh, having COVID were out the door because now I've lost taste and smell, which was the prominent symptoms, right? So um, I went and I, I did my best to try to find a test to get tested. And that's, I think throughout the whole experience, that was the most disappointing part to me was not being able to find a test uh, readily available because trying to get an appointment, it was impossible. Like at CVS, at the Minute Clinics, at the, I mean, and we were in Orange County, so maybe in LA County, but I even tried in Long Beach and nothing. nothing. I couldn't get a test. So I decided to go to the ER at one in the morning. Um, and Hogue Hospital, they, they took me in, but so it, it, I felt like, you know, have you ever seen um, kind of like those quarantine CDC uh, scenes in a movie, right? Like end of the world type things or super, super Everything disease, pretty much it. a pandemic. So <laughs> that's what was happening. Um, there was nobody there, but there was this tent to where I was like, the un untouchables, right? <laughs> that I was a part of. Um, and mind you, my symptoms are still mild at this point. And the reason why I couldn't get an appointment for all the other ones was that they were pretty much telling you, they were telling me that my, my symptoms were too mild. So I, I, I did like the biggest, biggest performance of my life. I probably would have won an Oscar for how much I sold <laughs> the lack of symptoms that I had at the time. <laughs> um, I was praying to God so hard that I would have, ha that I would have a fever, right? Cause I didn't have a fever. And the nurse came up to check me and it's like, okay, so what symptoms do you have? And I'm naming everything in the book. Mind you, I, I don't have all of them yet, but, and I'm like this, I'm like, I can't breathe. Oscar and, award. Oh my God, dude, Oscar. it was crazy. I was too shameless, but I was getting a fucking test right? if it was gonna kill me. Cause I needed the confirmation, you know? I wanted to know, and of course, I felt like it was my responsibility to be able to be part of the data, to know how many people are truly having it and what are the symptoms and, and you know, so I didn't want to guess. I didn't want to go on accident out because I thought that, you know, just whatever excuse I would have had to maybe go and get groceries or whatever that I needed to know for a fact that I was positive. And so then when she took my temperature, I had a fever. Oh my God, I kissed God through the air. I said, thank you, Jesus. You really want me to get this test today. And then they took an x-ray of my lungs and I, they showed that I had infections in the lower parts of both my lungs. Um, and then the nurse, you know, a lot of the time for these tests, you're actually self-testing. But the nurse actually administered the test for me and damn, now that's a whole other experience. It's like, can I get your name first? Because I felt like you just violated my nostril <laughs> and it impregnated it, right? It was like deep in there, tickled my brain and it probably came out my eye. Um, but it, it was crazy. It was crazy how they did it. And then it was like the longest eight seconds. This is what they said. It's like, it's going to be eight seconds. And it's like, that eight seconds was like 20 seconds. It was like, she kept twirling it in there, you know? <laughs> and then, oh, by the way, we're going to do the other nostril too. It was like, fuck. But I, yeah, and then, but then at, at the end of it, they said it was gonna take three to five days because this is the time when it was starting to maybe boom a little bit, all the people getting it, excuse me. And they were, they, 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 they were back ordered. I mean like backlogged with all the test results. And so um, I didn't get my results until the, like five days later. And that by then, and by then, 
I already knew I had the shit. You know what I mean? Like I was just, I was hallucinating at this point. Um, I had it so bad, I didn't know what day it was. I was just so grateful that Mata only had it for three days so that he could watch our our young kids. Wow. And that was scary because I'm like, I can't even imagine if both my kids had my symptoms or close to it, having to take care of myself and having to take care of my children. That's what really scared me. That That is a, a crazy experience to actually go through that. Yeah. And to again, you know, it's it's, it's one thing to uh, to survive 2020, but to actually go through that experience, and then you know what I mean, like transitioning out of that, right? And then you know, you, you regaining your your health. Uh, what were some of the? Because again, a lot of people weren't working at the time. Yes. You know, what was some of the transition that you actually had to do or experience um, that you did it before? Um, like transitions from. Like, just not working? Yes. I mean, because obviously people had a quarantine. You could, you know, they pretty much had to shut down. Yeah. I, well, that that was odd. Okay, I'm a people person. And in the business that we're in, we're entertainers. So we're constantly at shows. We're constantly at events. And everything got shut down. Like, literally, the world paused um, or damn near stopped, per se, right? And that that was a crazy transition. Having to fight for just your basic needs. I think was even crazier, i.e. paper toilet, like toilet paper, <laughs> right? Toilet paper and um, and cleaning supplies. It was like, but the toilet paper still fucking blew my mind because I'm, I'm still not quite understanding why toilet paper had to be out of supply. I mean, water, obviously, I could understand. Maybe even paper towels because, you know, you're using that to clean stuff. But, I mean... W- Maybe because everybody had diarrhea as one of the symptoms, and so you had to make sure you had enough <laughs> toilet paper. But that that was crazy, um, those kind of transitions. But then also, uh, as an entertainer, it hit us really hard. It hit us really hard because that's our moneymaker, right? We entertain people, um, shows, concerts. My husband is a musician. He's a gigging musician and all he's usually gone eight months out of the year on tour and it completely stopped so then the initial panic of are we how are we gonna eat how are we gonna um survive and then it was like a slap in the face when the first stimulus check came out and it was like what the fuck am i supposed to do (laughs) with (laughs) what is this and okay so it's like twelve hundred dollars per person right per adult and 600 per kid or 500 per kid, something like 500 or six. How about they don't give me anything for my kids? <laughs> so I'm all. You experienced it all. Yeah, I'm all, really? I only have two of these little shits and I can't even get paid for them, you know? <laughs> yeah, it, it, everything was crazy when you, th- I thought that especially being in America and I don't know if it's a certain arrogance that we have here in America that being the top dog, that certain things that happen around the world don't happen to us. Well, it, really it was an eye opener. Yeah, nobody is is safe. Like when when the world decides to say enough, and that's what happened. You know, and and the transition with our leaders, and then all of the turmoil, not only with the pandemic, but also just the social divide. Um, people were glued more now to their um, to their devices, to television, and, and kind of binge watching the news to find out whatever information. I mean, in the midst of it, I try to get creative and, and get on TikTok. Oh, there we TikTok. go. Try to entertain myself. Okay. Um, uh, did some of that a little bit. Actually, did kind of like lockdown with the Greys, our own kind of version. Uh, me and Mata uh, uh, showcasing our talents, right, of music and um, and just being together, lockdown together so do you feel like uh, uh every one of those little came out of the the pandemic yes talk about that i absolutely do i i feel like it does it because i got to spend so much time with myself and so much time reflecting and then so much time on zoom uh calls and facetime calls and and just calls in general to my family members and keeping relations that way and um i found out that i still just that passion that I kind of lost uh, or wasn't quite sure of um, my passion for people. And I wanted to just really encompass that and really focus on that and 
there was a better way of doing it and when we were able to have the opportunity um, everyone loves Lulu was definitely the platform for it because it's called everyone loves Lulu but it's more like Lulu loves everyone so it's kind of like that double entendre it's more my love for people that's reflected so as far as like those that are watching this and listening to this, you know, kind of going forward, man, what can people expect from the show? Everyone Loves Lulu is about you. It's about you and it's about me. It's about our, the frailties of human condition. It's about um, everything human that we go through um, from the emotions, the highs, the lows, the experiences. And, and I mean, what exactly does that mean? It means that I literally want to know what makes you tick, what makes you you, and I'm fascinated for it. And I think um, everyone has a story to tell, and I want to be that person that tells it. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> everyone loves Lulu. Everyone loves Lulu. You have to tune in. You got you to gotta make sure you check it out um, every week. I'll be here for you. And um, at Miss Lulu, M Y Z L U L U, Island Block Network, Island Block TV. Uh, make sure you check out all those handles and those avenues to be able to check out Everyone Loves Lulu. Because we love to see, hear, and speak love. See love, hear love, speak love. Everyone loves Lulu.